thanks for braving the New York City spring cold. Uh, my talk is Python on Rails, uh, aka Python on Trains. Um, but uh, it, it is a the idea is a safety um, system. Uh, on uh, it's a locomotive posted mobile app. Uh, also, with apologies to uh, Francis for calling it a mobile app. Um, I broke up the talk into a, a few sections just to make it easier to keep track of, um, of what section I'm in. By the way, I was really nervous before, but seeing so many friendly faces here makes me feel much more relaxed. Um, so a little bit about positive train control. Uh, my, the application that I work on, I'm the, lead, uh, technic the technical lead and the project manager for this program called Cosma. Uh, and uh, some talk about programming in, Cos uh, programming in Cosma and some about testing. So let's get on with it. Uh, positive Train Control 101. Um, has anyone here heard of Positive Train Control or has an idea of what it does? Uh, not, no, none of my former colleagues, please. <laughs> oh, it's okay. It is a, um, it, it's a safety system. Uh, it's federally mandated. Um, uh, it has to go into effect by, um, it, it, well, it applies to all the Class 1 railroads and Amtrak. Uh, and CSX, my client, is a Class 1 railroad, so it applies to CSX. Uh, this is a, um, a picture of uh, a train wreck uh, from September 2008 uh, in California. Um, a commuter and a train and freight train collided, uh, and there were a lot of casualties. And within that same month, uh, it doesn't seem like that long ago, but Congress passed that law within the same month, uh, mandating positive train control. Uh, and all the Class 1 railroads in Amtrak have to implement it by December of next year. Uh, what is positive train control? It's an automated safety system that um, is designed to detect dangerous situations and um, warn the crew that they must take action to, to avert danger. And if the crew does not respond, uh, it will actually uh, avert danger itself uh, by stopping the train, applying the brakes and stopping the train. And th this is a display in, uh, that an engineer might see um, when approaching a, a, a railroad switch. A, a switch is when uh, it's a Y in the tracks and there's a controller uh, on that switch that tells the train, which directs the train to one track or the other. <coughs> Positive train control uh, is aware of all the switch positions uh, when it's safe to drive. If the switch position is unknown, the train may not pass that switch and the uh, system is telling it that I'm gonna start braking soon, in, in this case one second, uh, if you don't hit the brakes yourself. And then um, uh, a few seconds later, um, positive train control has actually um, applied the brakes uh, to stop the train and then they avert a, a very dangerous situation, which is going into a switch where the, where the direction is unknown, and which, which could cause it to go on a track where there's another train and could crash into the other train. Now, um, to get this kind of system implemented, you can imagine that there's a big impact on the railroad systems. Um, Railroad systems that right now don't know where every train is, and, and the on board the train may not know automatically what the next signal is saying, like whether it's red or green, whether I'm allowed to go through it, uh, or, or have to stop, or what my speed limit is. That's all up to the engineer uh, to keep to pay attention, uh, so that the and the engineer knows at all times where the train is allowed to be, how fast it's allowed to go. But to implement positive train control, it will, uh, will they'll, they'll need a lot of new back office servers. Uh, some new wayside devices, that's uh, physical devices along the train tracks, uh, new communication systems, and also uh, a lot of new equipment right on board the locomotive. Uh, and that's where, um, that's where my application comes in. Um, so this is, this is some of the lo locomotive equipment. And um, this is a, um, a train computer. It's the computer that's actually listening to signals from around uh, in the environment, figuring out whether it's allowed to be where it is, deciding whether what to, what to uh, say to the crew, um, displaying a graph of how much braking distance the engineer has before they need to stop the train, and, make, and counting down, like I'm gonna start applying the brakes in 10 seconds, and then making the decision to hit the brakes. That's the onboard PC computer. And there are some, in, uh, some displays that the engineer and conductor can see, like we saw before, saying, hey, I'm braking for you. Uh, this is a 220 megahertz radio. Uh, um, it's a, it, and it, it is being installed in locomotives along with radio towers uh, as, a, as an additional communications medium. 
Um, this is a, an onboard routing uh, server. Uh, it's made by GE. There's actually two onboard routing servers, one at a time on a locomotive, but it could be one or the other. This is the one by GE. And, and this um, routing server has access to an AT&T cell modem, a Wi-Fi cell modem, uh, uh, I'm sorry, AT&T, Verizon, Wi-Fi, and GPS, and then it can communicate with, with that, uh, that radio that I showed on the previous page. So it's the communication system and the router, the network router. Uh, the, um, so with all this new equipment on board, there is a need to make sure it's running right uh, and to, to check it out and when there's a new install and, uh, and also to uh, upgrade software on, on, the, on the devices when they, um, when they need software upgrades. And um, that is where um, the Cosma application comes in and, and that's, um, that's the application that my team is working on. It's, it's, uh, it's an agent uh, that runs on the locomotive, agent in this sense meaning a program that's running in an unusual location but that gives it a, a big advantage to doing the kinds of things that it needs to do from that location. And in, in, my, in my case, um, the, um, the location is on that onboard routing server that, that I um, showed on the previous slide. Um, this, this is a complex diagram and I don't expect you to know everything, but I wanted to point to the Python parts. So this is Python on, right on board the locomotive. Uh, the Cosma application, uh, well, it, it stands for CSX Onboard Systems Management Agent. Uh, and systems management in the sense that it's, it's managing all these systems and checking them out. Um, there's three Python applications. Two of them are on the onboard routing server. This is the main program, Cosma, it, um, and this is a Cosma supervisor application. Its job is to start and stop Cosma and to make sure Cosma is still running. If Cosma stops running, it will start a new instance of Cosma. There's another, oh, you can see look, on the locomotive messaging server, the, the top arrow, uh, there's something called the Cosma auxiliary agent, kind of romantic name there, um, but it's, it's on another one, of, it's on a, a box, um, a subcomponent of the train, the PTC train computer. Um, that deals with messaging, and its its job is to listen to Cosma and make sure that, that if Cosma stops sending messages, it will alert to the um, the back office, send an alert, so someone will try to find out why Cosma is not working. Okay, Cosma's primary functions. Um, there there's several primary functions that it has uh, to check out PTC equipment before it gets deployed in the field, and this is. Um, this is a new GE locomotive, uh, and this is the kind of environment that you might see when they're installing positive train control equipment uh, on the locomotive for the first time. And Cosma will, uh, when, when they install that routing server and they turn it on and they run Cosma, Cosma will check all the PTC-related devices and make a report to let them know how many of the devices are working uh, and how many are installed uh, and whether it's good to go uh, to the next sketch, uh, sketch stage. Um, Another uh, Cosmo function is to um, report on uh, problems that it detects while the locomotive is running, or when it stops, but normally when it's running. Um, and also to correct problems if it detects a certain, certain classes of problems. Uh, in this case, we see uh, a report that uh, this is a console in an office, uh, in, 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 the, in a back office. And um, when we blow up, we see that Cosmo is saying the, the AT&T cell modem is powered off, and I'm going to try to power it on. So it, it not only monitors um, for problems, but it also, it, in some cases, it tries to correct the problem. It also reports signal strength from the various Wi-Fi uh, sources on board. Uh, we, as I mentioned, we've got AT&T cell modem and, and a Verizon cell modem, Wi-Fi, and radio. And it's sitting, Cosma, as the train moves, it's, it's, it's recording the signal strength from all of those devices and sending uh, basically like telemetry data every 400 feet. Uh, back to uh, the office. And this is a graph uh, that I created on a, on a public website uh, with some of that data um, that shows um, an area of interest around the center of the graph. And you can see that there, uh, it, it's hard to see from this small uh, legend, but the purple and blue are stronger signals and the other colors are weaker signals. And this is the part they were interested in and it turned out that it had a pretty strong signal for the Verizon cell mode. Another function is to perform software updates to onboard systems, uh, either in the shop or on the rail. Uh, so Cosma is being developed now. It's not, it's, it, it, one of the first versions of Cosma is being put on test locomotives to update system software for these various onboard devices. Uh, and it can happen either when the locomotive is in the shop or when it's out running uh, in our city. 
This is the section on programming in Cosmo because it's about Python, and I've only had one Python with some arrows there. So now, Python programming on, uh, on the locomotive on this Cosmo is not really rocket science compared to awesome uh, applications like Patrick's um, and, and ones that, that we'll hear about. Um, but uh, I, I, from, my, from my understanding of the group and from getting to know some of the people, I know that there's a wide variety of experience and career, career um, paths. So I thought it might be uh, very useful and interesting to, to, to have this perspective on Python programming too. Um, you could probably think of some unusual circumstances or unusual restrictions that you may have uh, when you're programming an application that runs on a moving locomotive. And, uh, well, we have some of them here. Um, we're not allowed to interfere with the proper functioning of any safety crit critical systems. Cosma is not designated as a safety critical system, so that if Cosma stops running, PTC will still work. But it will just take longer for people to find out that there's something going wrong, if, if things do go wrong. Um, we, we can be in and out of connectivity. We may be in a place where there's radio towers and cell towers uh, and GPS, where we could be in a mountain or a tunnel, and we could be out of connectivity. So we can't make any assumptions about when we can send messages, or even really when we can interface with the other um, onboard systems, because there, some could be turned on or off. There are circuit breakers in there that can trip. We, can, we don't have a controlled shutdown. When we code, we're sort of ingrained to write a program to do some initialized initialization when we start. And then when we shut down, we do some shutdown so that when we initialize next, it'll be a smooth initialization. But the shutdown in, uh, for Cosma is the engineer turning the circuit breaker off and power is disconnected from the machine. So we don't have a controlled shutdown. We also um, we know that cell bandwidth is very expensive. Uh, when I go over my AT&T cell modem uh, plan by a gigabyte, uh, AT&T charges me by 15 bucks. But um, if I go over the, my cell plan with a gigabyte, um, with the, the, the high availability contract that CSX has with AT&T, you can add a couple of zeros, or two or three zeros. <laughs> and um, we also are not, this is a minor thing, but we're not really allowed to do much writing to the hard drive because it's a solid state drive and these wear out over time and they're trying to minimize uh, the wear so that they can last as long as possible because when you have to swap, swap out hardware on the locomotive, it's expensive, especially when the rail, when the locomotive is what is powering your, the revenue for your company. Uh, another big deal is that we have to stay aware, aware of changes in the onboard environment that, that, um, that when you write a program, you, you really, well, unless it's a mobile app, you may be, um, you may be um, secure in knowing that things are going to be about the same when you start one time as when you started before. But we can't make that assumption. Uh, they may take the onboard routing server off the locomotive and put it on a different locomotive and turn it on. And we may know if we wake up on a new locomotive and start broadcasting to the back office saying, we're the old locomotive, that's going to cause problems. So we have to be aware of what locomotive we're on. Some of the monitoring that we do, like the signal strength mapping, is, um, is really relevant only when we're in our own home territory. CSX's territory is about territory is east of the Mississippi. And trains go west of the Mississippi. They go north in Canada. But we don't really need to map their cell modem uh, signal trains. So we turn that off when we're out of home territory. So it's like geofence. Um, the positive train control state uh, can change as well. Uh, we, uh, we saw it before that the, the system was warning, saying uh, positive train control is about to break. We saw another time where it says, I'm trying to initialize, but I can't get it in touch. We saw another time when it said, I'm raking. That's called enforcing. Uh, if, if the PTC computer is counting down saying 10, 9, about to break in 8 seconds, we're not going to say, here's your software upgrade. <laughs> <laughs> so we have to be aware of what state the, the computer is in. <laughs> And, uh, and our programming environment is it's Red Hat. Uh, it's Red Hat uh, Enterprise Linux server, and we run Python 2.6.6. And it's, you know, it's not that bad. It's actually very. Good. <laughs> <laughs> First, we thought, well, Python's up. Python's up to 2.7 point something. And but when we started coding in Python 2.6.6, it was really pretty good. And there's only a couple of gotchas that we run across, and none of them are really world rocking. Um, it's a multi-threaded application, and um, it, it, it's about the least likely um, candidate for parallelization that you could imagine, because all the, the threads hardly do any work. Um, they, there's a, a thread dedicated basically to every kind of condition that should be monitored, 
and it, most of the threads sleep for most of the time. So it's really a, an ideal application of Python multi-threading. Because when you hear about Python multi-threading, you may say, oh, you know, they're falling into that pitfall of trying to do some CPU intensive processing while other while the UI is running. But we none of our processes are CPU intensive. They're all I/O bound. They're all basically timer bound. Uh, they um, they wake up, check something, and go back to sleep. Although the single mapping thread um, that maps the the, the uh, signal strength says it goes, uh, it has to send a, a signal every 400 feet. So it can't just wake up. It can't set a timer and wake up. It has to be aware of where the where the where the locomotive is by checking GPS. Okay, some code. Uh, now, I'm, I'm, you don't have to look at this code. Um, it's too too closely. I, I wanted to make sure that um, the code that's interesting to look at. It's really you can if it piques your interest, you can look at it later. Um, but the idea here is that there's a big thing here and a small thing here. This is a config file, um, like in the in the any initial in any format with a section and um, and an um, entry sound with a section. Um, we have, this is a pattern that we use. We use two configuration files. One is uh, installed with with Cosma on the locomotive in the, in the environment, and one is the override config file that the program maintains as it runs, uh, and that helps us. That has a couple of good. Uh, Results. One is that we spend less time writing to the hard drive if we need to upgrade. We never write to the default config, which is very big. And also, when when, Pyth when Cosma is upgraded, um, there will be a new default configuration file, but we'll stay save any uh, overrides that we've saved in our uh, override configuration file. So we'll have all those same overrides which were desired. And this is this is an example. This is the most simple example that you'll ever see, really, at one of these Python meetings. Uh, we, when we're getting a string from the config, there's a class called Cosma config. It checks the override config. If it finds it, it uses that. If it doesn't find it, it uses the default config. Um, this is, uh, there's another pattern that we use, uh, just-in-time configuration queries. Cosma is a dynamically updatable uh, device. It's configurable over the wire. Somebody from the back office can send a message saying, change this thread interval from 60 seconds to two minutes. And it has to upgrade it, update its configuration at that time. So it's it's almost second nature for coders like me to, um, in the initialization part of your class, read your configuration parameters and use them during the main bulk of the of the code. But what, as you can see here, there's not much being initialized in the init. But when you get a GPS string, we read the IP address, the timeout from the config before we get our um, our GPS string from from one of the communications devices. Um, this is um, and also another pattern is that we don't want to overtax onboard systems. Uh, if the if the thread is sleeping for 15 minutes and wakes up and has to do some sampling, probably a minute or two minutes of, of freshness is good enough if it's been sampled recently. Uh, and, and if several threads happen to wake up at the same time, why do you have to know my, the IP address of the cell phone three times in one second? So we have this pattern where uh, if where we query um, a device. We, we specify what freshness of data we need. Uh, and then the, 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 this class will just give us the cached version if, if what it has is fresh enough. If it's not, it will resample. Uh, we have this uh, pattern of, um, of a neutral uh, facade and adapter uh, because, as I mentioned, one of the, um, some, some of the devices are different depending on which locomotive it is. But the, the business code doesn't need to uh, differentiate. We don't want it to have to differentiate at runtime. So the, the business code has a neutral interface uh, that it can that can read whether it works on the GE version of the onboard routing server or on the one from Coleman Technologies. Uh, you may think it's funny that we um, that I have a slide on commenting. <laughs> um, we actually, um, if you ever go to work at CSX Corporation, and if you do, I'll be happy to get to know you if I'm still there, which I hope to be. Um, they're my client. Um, they are dedicated to safety for, uh, for in every aspect of the organization. And if you're ever around people who work for CSX, that will come through clearly. Because in every aspect of their, their organization, they're 100% they're dedicated to safety. Uh, so we have to, when we write our comments and we write our, and we code review comments, we have to think of them uh, in, in terms of how they would look uh, in a federal investigation of a serious train crash. <laughs> <laughs> Um, 
So I, I have a few hardware access methods that we use. Um, UDP, um, a lot of these devices on board, they'll broadcast in UDP. So that eliminates the problem of, of um, overtaxing them. Um, we'll never overtax. Uh, because they'll just ping, uh, ping us, we'll, we'll receive it when, when we get it. Uh, the problem is that we, um, the, you, not all devices are broadcasting, um, and that the device just determines the sample rate, and we can't determine it. Uh, we, um, this is an example, you don't have to read it, but it's, it's, it's a, a socket class, uh, a UDP connection class that creates a socket based on whether you're sending, receiving, or receiving a broadcast, and it, it took us a long time to get this right. And I thought that if, if this helps even one person, maybe this 10 seconds will have, uh, will have been worth it. Uh, we, um, we, another hardware access method is SNMP. Does anyone here have any experience with SNMP or, or know what it is? It's, it's, a, it's a networking protocol that's part of the IP uh, protocol suite that is for querying networked devices. Uh, the idea is that you send a query saying, here's the address I want to query. An agent on the device will respond to that address and say, here's the value. Like, here's a cell modem will say, here's my IP address. Uh, another uh, uh, a switch might say, here's my uh, configuration version. Uh, we, we tried two different SNMP libraries. There's a native uh, or a C a Python one, and there's a pure Python implementation of PySNMP. We ended up going with this, the net SNMP version because it's it's much faster, and that was the, really the critical thing. Although if you send, send in the malformed OID, that's the address that you're querying, it can crash your program. It will just, Python will stop. But now what we did was we put in uh, checks to make sure that the, uh, the OID is not malformed. This is an SNMP example. Um, it, it, it's really just for filing. Um, it, this is the first part of a, um, of a query. We, we pass in the query a dictionary of mnemonics that, of, of of samples that we want to take and their OIDs, their addresses, uh, and, and it, as, it, as it goes through, uh, we create, it, 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 accessing this NetS and NP library, it creates these bind objects and then it sends the bind objects and what it returns is a dictionary with the same mnemonic uh, variable names but with the results for the, those OIDs. And um, I'm not, uh, you don't need to really concentrate too much on it, but if you are into SNMP and you, and you remember this talk, it might save you some time to do it this way because a lot of this, a lot of these libraries are not that well documented or, or and there's not a lot of activity on the internet um, that, that says how to use them right. Uh, you can get the, um, you can get the um, drive, drive health information is one of the items that we monitor and one of the, and some information that we report. Uh, and the smart control uh, utility uh, is, was designed to give, to, to query information about hard drives. And inevitably, the, the, the device information that we need is in these obscure large integers that have like unknown attribute, unknown attribute, but we have to get information from the manufacturers and then parse them byte by byte or even bit by bit to figure out what it means. Uh, like which one is a power cycle count, how is it expressed in a floating point number, and we report that because they want to keep track of how well the, the solid state drive is, is working, and how soon it's going to need to be replaced. You can get the drive um, vendor and model from, not, you don't have to use the smart control command, you can uh, read a couple, parse a couple of pseudo files on the system and you can get the drive, hard drive vendor and model. Uh, a couple other access methods you can use, Telnet and SSH, I won't go into that. Um, uh, development and testing environments, we use uh, Eclipse and HiDev, which are just awesome, they're, they're great for our development, we can use them in, in Windows and Linux. And if you're looking for an integrated development environment, I can, I can hardly, heartily recommend them. Uh, we also um, use write unit tests for all of our code, and we test them right in, um, in Eclipse with PyDev. Uh, and we also run nose tests, which is a command line application you, you may be familiar with, but it will sniff out all of, the, um, all of the unit tests that it can find in your folder and run them. Uh, and in, after we debug our code in the development environment, we can test them in, in a lab. This is, this is a Verizon lab. It's not our Verizon lab, but it's very similar to the, way the, the, the lab where we test. And it's got some of the PTC, the onboard equipment in there, so we can actually test it against the real equipment rather than against simulators. Um, this is a high rail vehicle. It's a vehicle equipped with some rails that will let it run on the railroad track. Uh, I couldn't find a picture of, the, this is a true PTC high rail. Uh, and it's got the PTC onboard equipment in the back, but I couldn't find a picture of it on the rail. This is a picture that a colleague took uh, in the parking lot of CSX headquarters in Jacksonville, Florida. 
but that will let you um, really work out the, um, the differences in like cell signal strengths and, um, and things that you really need to be moving to, to test your application with. And it, once you're done testing every other way, um, there's no, no substitute uh, for testing on the real thing. And that guy better get out of the way, unless there's any questions. Cool. Is that it? That's me. Oh, that's <laughs> <laughs> that was great. Though. Thanks so much. Um, we definitely have time for a couple of questions. Great. So at the beginning you mentioned uh, it's not rocket science, but actually, what do you think about um, things like Python on, on planes or, or, or spacecraft? Well, I think the, um, the fact that it's being used for, um, for interacting with safety critical um, devices uh, makes it suitable for an application in other transportation uh, related indus industries. And um, I mean, the number of people at risk in a, in a train crash is comparable to the number of people at risk in a plane crash. So um, I think that having established it in this railroad industry is probably a uh, good um, sign that it's suitable for other, other transportation. Uh, what level of encryption do you have on your communications? Uh, some of this looks like it could easily be spoofed, particularly like the GPS signal. Someone could just put a GPS jammer or a pseudo GPS transponder near a train, and all of a sudden the train thinks it's going 200 miles per hour. That that would be a worse. Um, that would not. That that would affect our application, and we would send erroneous data to the back office, where we're saying we're in the wrong location. It would have a much worse effect on the safety critical systems that need to access GPS to make sure that they're in the right location uh, and they're not over overstepping a, a red signal. Um, we do have, we do use um, symmetric uh, keys, uh, but not for encrypting. Only a few of our messages are signed. We, and we have a, a private key and passphrase and a public key for the back office. Our configuration, when, when configuration messages come in, to tell us to change the thread interval of this one thread from one minute to two minute, we verify uh, using those uh, using the, um, the the public key of the uh, the sending system that is valid, that is signed. And when we say when we respond, when they ask us what are our, what is our configuration currently, when we respond, that is signed as well. Uh, we currently do not have any messages that are passed that are deemed to be um, that need encryption. Another question here. So not actually a Python question, but I was really curious about all the use of wireless. I know that in the past for trains, the model would be that you'd have an actual wired cable. And I see this every time I go home to western Kansas where there's some old decaying railroad tracks and the cables are sort of falling down. So I'm wondering to what extent is wireless the future for train uh, signaling, uh, or is it already happening? The wire, wire is code, what they call code line in the railroad industry is still in use uh, for signaling. PTC does not affect signaling, it listens to signaling and that's what some of these new wayside devices are there to do. They uh, read these code line signals and tell the PTC system what the state of the signal is in. Um, there's also another communication channel uh, which is along the rail itself because it's conducted. Um, there, there are fiber optic, you can place a fiber optic uh, fi a fiber optic fiber along the tracks and to de detect vibrations along the tracks and you can even detect when someone is walking on the tracks from very far away uh, using that. So I don't think the cabled, um, even though some of them uh, you, that you've seen are decrepit, I don't think the cabling is going away because of positive train control. Awesome. Last question. Do you think that Python will ever be used in a mission critical role? You've been in observation obviously for something like uh, life critical and mission critical systems, there are certain requirements typically, for instance, in aerospace applications and medical applications. But I'm curious, being involved in an application like this, do you think Python will ever make a transition to be applied in truly mission critical or life critical roles? I think it has the potential to. I think it's establishing itself as a mainstream programming language. Uh, and the fact that more and more people are adopting it, and even <coughs> in, in a, you can make the, the argument that Cosma is a mission critical and life, uh, certainly mission critical. Uh, you could make the argument that, Pi that Cosma is a life critical application because if we have a bug in our software, we could disrupt the functioning of the safety system. Like we could try to install software on the, tr the positive train control computer while it's trying, deciding whether to enforce 
the breaking or not. So in that sense, CSX has made this decision that Python is an acceptable language in that, uh, to put it in that application. Uh, as far as um, other mission critical applications or, or life critical applications, I, I, to be honest, I don't know how far Python has already um, dug into those or, or, or whether, it, um, or whether it's, there's an obstacle to doing that. Awesome. Thanks so much, Nick.